My name is Deji Olukatan. I'm the Senior Global Advocacy Manager at ACCESS. Uh, we're so excited to have you here today. And just a reminder to those of you who are watching this live stream that we do want to have some interactivity. Uh, if you do have questions for the panelists, please tweet them as they arise. Uh, it's easier for us than trying to filter through uh, many towards the end of the session. And we'll try to get your question to the panelists. Um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Access's Executive Director, Brett Solomon, to share a few remarks. Thank you. Hi. How was lunch? Excellent. Um, so my name is Brett Solomon. I'm the Executive Director of Access, accessnow.org. Um, <clears throat> our mission is to defend and extend the digital rights of users at risk around the world. And I remember six years ago when, um, when we founded Access, um, and it was in the midst of the Iranian election, um, which you might remember the where is my vote election when tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people were on the streets of Tehran. And I think in a way it was the first time that we'd seen the use of citizen media, where on, you know, on BBC and CNN we'd seen like citizen footage of protests happening. Um, and I think it was a real wake-up call that the internet was this central place for individuals to be able to assert their agendas, to be able to exercise their right to freedom of expression. And of course the governments were recognising that as well, the Revolutionary Guards, the Iranian government and Ahmadinejad and his cohort. And activists and freedom of expression advocates were being hauled into the security services. And I remember one, one activist um, was there before the security services and they basically provided him with transcripts of his email. And one email account was encrypted and the other one was not. And the unencrypted transcripts were used as evidence against him in his trial. That was 2009. Think about what you guys have been doing since 2009. I know what he's doing, he's still in prison. So this question of encryption is not just theoretical, it's not just financial, it's not just a question of national security. It comes back to Access's mission about defending and extending the digital rights of users at risk. This is a question potentially of life and death. And I want people to think about that as we continue the discussion in the afternoon. Um, Access has a three-part approach to, our, to achieving our mission. We do practical and principled policy that we provide to decision makers within companies and governments. We have an advocacy arm that tries to turn policy into practice. And we have a technical arm which runs the digital security helpline. The digital security helpline runs 24-7 service. It follows the sun and it supports civil society actors around the world who are facing online attacks. We are constantly advising actors, whether they be LGBT campaigners or freedom of expression advocates or environmentalists, that encryption is essential to their safety and security. Um, <clears throat> Access has offices around the world. We have the team here in DC led by Amy Stepanovich and while we're at it, let's have a round of applause for her. I think Amy came to me about six, a week, six weeks ago and said, I have an idea, and I was like, oh, no, not another one. <laughs> of course, they're all brilliant. Um, this one was the Crypto Summit, and here we are six weeks later. Um, so we, yeah, we have offices in, in D.C., in Tunis, in North Africa, in Costa Rica, in Brussels, Manila, New York. We have staff in Latin America and Africa. We also run RightsCon, which I think is the premier event on human rights and technology. The second part of the Crypto Summit will be happening in San Francisco uh, next year, um, March 30th, 31st, and the 1st of April. So we'll have the second part. This part of the Crypto Summit is looking at policymakers in DC, and the second part will be looking at policymakers within Silicon Valley and in the, within the corporate sector. Um, you guys don't know who's in this room, but I'm actually the only person I think who has the list of everybody who's in attendance. And let me tell you, there's some very serious decision makers here. Um, which means that this room is actually important to the future of cryptography, and I know everybody is taking that seriously. Um, but we do need to show leadership because, as Raman said, like, what happens here in DC is actually replicated around the world. There are people watching this discussion in capitals from Delhi to Geneva, and um, so I'm really asking us to exercise our leadership when we think about all of the issues from, <clears throat> from the user base all the way 
to the users at risk all the way to, to the economic and financial considerations that um, encryption um, provides for the tech sector here in the US. Um, and finally, as we continue the discussion this afternoon, I also want to reiterate what Roman said earlier, which is there's only a portion of the community, the world community online. There's still another three billion that are going to come online. And what kind of internet are we going to provide and make available to them? Again, the decisions that we make here over the next six months, the next year, are crucial not, to the current not just to the current internet population, but to the global internet population that's yet to come online. So um, without any further ado, um, I've asked people to thank Amy, but also to acknowledge the role of the whole Access team, including Nathan White, who did a fantastic job in putting on today, and, and Jamie Tomasello, thank you. And then finally for the 2.15 session this afternoon, um, can encryption save us? On the, the tables are cards. We're asking people to fill in um, those cards with two questions. So in your professional experience interacting with encryption, what are the biggest challenges posed by the tools and technologies? And what are the biggest opportunities? Your answers to those questions will help to inform the session at 2.15, um, which is <coughs> can encryption save us? And um, with that, Let's move to the next session. And thank you very much, all of you, for coming. Welcome back, everybody. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just immediately call our next speakers to the stage. If you can join me in introducing uh, Nate Cardozo from the Electronic Frontier Foundation, Carrie Cordero from Georgetown University Law Center, formerly with the US Department of Justice, Jamil Jaffer with George Mason University Law School, and Sarah McCune with Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto. Thank you, everybody. We would? Yep, we got it. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. So we are going to each start out um, by giving you a very quick snippet of sort of our overarching theme um, for the conversation that we're going to have, and we're going to uh, keep it as, as quickly moving as we can. Um, so I'm Carrie Cordero. I'll start out, and then I will turn to Nate, I think. Is that what it says? That's what it says. That's what we're doing. OK, so I'm going to start out. Obviously, we're talking about uh, going dark and encryption. And so from my perspective, the going dark debate is more than an issue of just encryption or technology. There are important public policy issues at stake. It is as much of a law enforcement issue as well, and one of public safety, as it is as a national security one. And there has been no citizen's consensus to create a law enforcement free zone where criminals and terrorists can act with impunity. The debate that we're all taking place in has real consequences for victims and our system of justice. Great, thanks. Um, my thesis is, uh, comes from a different perspective. If the fact that attacks like Freak and Logjam continue to plague us nearly 20 years after the death of export grade crypto, if that fact teaches us anything, it's that legislating insecurity for the bad guys will only succeed in ensuring insecurity for us all. Uh, so, you know, I think that the, the challenge with the going dark problem is that the government's done a particularly bad job in segregating between uh, the issues it has. One, the government has an issue with getting access to uh, communication streams, going to the providers, having the ability to interconnect with the providers and obtain data when they have a lawful court order. Separately, they have a problem of the expanding use of encryption and where they can obtain access to decrypted data. And those are two separate going dark problems. Oftentimes, the government and others confuse the two or combine the two. And I think if you segregate the problems out, you can really talk about them intelligently. I think it's, there's a, it's a hard way to say that the government shouldn't be able to go to providers with lawful access and have the ability to, have the ability to connect in and get whatever data they can. The question of whether once they get encrypted data, though, where they can decrypt is a much harder question and is fraught with challenges both privacy and law enforcement related. 
And I do, I do think it's important, though, that we find a way to resolve this issue uh, in some way or another, because if we don't, I think both on the privacy side and the law enforcement side, you're going to have bad results, right? It's inevitable that there will be a terrorist attack, a child kidnapping, uh, some problem where the, the communication will be encrypted, the government won't be able to have access to it, and the government will complain, look, we have this real problem, and the privacy community ultimately will suffer because you'll get bad law, because ba hard cases make bad law. And so I think at the end of the day, we've got to find a middle ground, whatever that might be, uh, to find a way to address the legitimate concerns on both sides of this debate, the privacy, uh, the privacy concerns and the law enforcement concerns. Yes, I agree that the debate requires careful consideration of the needs of law enforcement, but also of the proven importance of encryption in global public digital security, particularly the security of civil society, activists, dissidents, and vulnerable groups. I also think it requires consideration of the long-term ripple effects, as was mentioned earlier today, of the choices we make concerning these questions. The stance taken within the US will inform other countries' approach to digital security and government access to communications content, including through demands on US companies. It will also affect the market for commercial spyware, which has already responded to the enhanced presence of encrypted traffic online with workaround tools designed for device level compromise for which encryption would not be an issue. Good policy will require treating these issues upfront and in a transparent manner. All right, so maybe I'll pick up from there. I think that gives you a sense of sort of the perspective that each of us comes with. And I know one of the goals of today is to try to take these different perspectives and move the dialogue forward. So I'll offer up two um, suggestions that I have that I think would help start bringing the different sides of this issue um, a, a little bit incrementally forward in the debate. Um, first, from the pro-all encryption advocate uh, perspective, from my perspective, there needs to be at least an acknowledgement that there really is a legitimate public policy issue here, um, and that there are real human costs that may very well be borne by sort of the people who are the most vulnerable, victims, um, children of crimes, uh, people like that. And so I think what the uh, law enforcement community is not hearing from the uh, technology community that is, that is most concerned with the cybersecurity issues is at least at the very starting point an acknowledgement that this is a legitimate public policy issue. On the other hand, um, the government, from the government perspective, the government needs to do a, a far better job of making the case that this is an issue that needs to be fixed. That the encryption, uh, the mass, what I'll call the mass deployment of encryption that we're seeing at a more rapid um, deployment, particularly at the consumer level, that that really is causing a real problem from law enforcement. And uh, as we've seen some from recent testimony, for example, the Deputy Attorney General last week, um, the answers to have you studied this, do you have any statistics, the answer of no, we haven't really studied it, and no, we don't really have any statistics, is just not going to be satisfactory. So on the government end, the government needs to do a better job of doing some data collection. And I, my suggestion would be that that really needs to include at a uh, more expansive level law enforcement at the state and local level so that people can have a better understanding of how this is affecting them. Well, except, of course, that we do have some statistics on this. We have the AOC report that came out. Um, I, I'm sorry, I just got here just before lunch, so I don't know if we've already talked about this today. But last year, the federal courts ran into encryption four times, or the f federal wiretap orders ran into encryption four times. That's it. That's, th that, that's the number that we're dealing with. 0.1%. Well, that's, I mean, that of, that of course assumes that they're able to bring the cases. If the data is encrypted, they may not be able to bring the cases. And so the no, lack no, of access to that's, data. That's applications. That's Title III applications. For, for access to encrypted data. Right. Yeah. So, look, I mean, that's a, that's a fair point. But, we, but right, we acknowledge, right, that today encryption is dramatically expanding, right? Um, and that the use of encryption, end to end encryption, right, that's taken place post Snowden is happening, right? And so I guess what I would ask is, is there an acknowledgement by the privacy community and the, the folks like those of you who work on these issues day to day that there are legitimate law enforcement needs for access to encrypted data? Or do you believe, nope, there's no legitimate need for access to encrypted data? There may well be, but we haven't, I mean, as, as I think Kerry recognized, law enforcement hasn't made the case 
well. And we, we there, there's this specter of won't somebody please think of the children, but we haven't actually seen it. Well, so so Jim Comey says, look, we see ISIS out there on on Twitter and social media recruiting people in the United States. He said this about two months ago. Uh, we see hundreds to thousands of people in the United States that are being recruited, who we watch, uh, we obtain surveillance orders for, and then they go dark because they're re ISIS recommends them use encryption. They start using encryption, and they go dark. Now, I don't know if I believe that or not, right? But that's the claim that Comey's making. Let's say that's true. Do you think we need access to that, the U.S. government needs access to that data? But can, can I just push back a little bit on that point there? Law enforcement has long recognized that those that they've um, determined are terrorists or criminals already use encryption. They already use encryption tools. In fact, that point was discussed this morning. Um, and if, if they're properly motivated, they're going to find a way to secure their communications. I think the position of law enforcement and the rhetoric that's uh, come to pass in the past year has really been prompted by the fact that encryption is becoming more and more popularized, more ubiquitous, more accessible. But the fact that it's more accessible is also the reason why those of us in civil society are becoming more secure. Because there are certain barriers to entry for civil society groups and activists to actually enhance their digital security. So the more encryption is implemented by design, the more it's built in, the less um, impediments there are to civil society actually using this for their work. Unfortunately, it seems as though law enforcement is saying that that ubiquity and that accessibility undermines their efforts. But if this is a situation in which criminals were already utilizing this kind of tool anyway, where does that leave us? Sure, so let's say, let's say that's true. Okay, so criminals are using this tool. If we know and you acknowledge they're using the tool, then the question becomes, for those criminals, or the people where the government has enough predication to go get a warrant, should they be able to have access to encrypted data? Well, if the criminals are using a form of encryption such as PGP in which only they hold the private key and it's not an issue of a company being involved, then there really is no question of, of whether or not they should or should not have access there because they won't have access to it unless they can... Right, and so what if, what if the communications are being held by, say, Google, and Google is using end to end, and the person has not implemented their own private key. It simply access the data at Google, which Google now does have access to because they're using TLS 1.3, right? Or they're going to implement 1.3 once it's in place, right? Should the government be able to have access to that data? That's the key question. Put but, aside, put aside where the government doesn't have, and whether it's it's ubiquitous and it's citizen activists. I'm talking about the easy case. In the easy case where the government has gone to a court, gotten a warrant from a judge uh, based on probable cause, should the government be able to have access to that data? But I think what you're asking is, should the government be able to have access to that content? Encrypt that they could. Unencrypted data, right. Can they, so should they be able to decrypt the I, data? I, I think the question is actually different. Okay. Right. So the, the, the answer to your question is, the, the government is, is, of course, free to try. But the, that's not the question that we're asking. Free to, free to, try. Free to try. Uh, like but, yeah, yeah, or, or, what, or any or endpoint attack or any sort of cryptanalytic attack. But that's not the question that, that, is, that, that is before Congress right now. That's not the question that's before the companies. Um, let me rephrase it. Pretend, stre stretch your imagination. Pretend I'm Moxie Marlin Spike. What should I do to my product? I, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting he should do anything. I'm asking the question of putting, putting to one side okay, what he what should, should do to his product. The question is, should the government have a lawful way to obtain access to the data where they've, where they've gone to a court, gotten a court order, and the judge has said, OK, You've got probable cause to believe this person is a criminal, a child predator, a terrorist, whatever. An independent federal judge, right? Article three, right? Uh, you know, nominated by the president, confirmed by the Senate to a life appointment. Said, yeah, you just like you have the access to go break into somebody's house and use a warrant to go into their house and search through all their belongings, sure, including their private drawers and their private effects of their diaries. You'd have access to their email. If that email has been encrypted by Google, not by the not by the person, but by Google itself, mm -hmm. should Google but have to be able to? But that's, but that's why I asked the question that I did, right? Moxie and Open Whisper Systems produces a product that uses end-to-end -end encryption. Look, what are, should he do when, when, are, he gets a, when he gets a Title III order? So we, we, look, there are plenty of ways to, in, to implement right, a public key and escrow system, right? There, do you think he should be required to? No, no. I, but what I'm saying is there are ways to do it. It's not like it's technologically impossible, right? You can use key encapsulation. You can use key splitting, right? I mean, the Schneier Report, which just came out a few, uh, few, a few weeks ago or a week or two ago, uh, makes the argument that, look, we 
we can't use key splitting because it's not fast enough for the government. The truth is, if the government has to pick between having no access to data and slower access, they'll take slower access. So that's just a canard. Well, I don't think that was Schneier's point. But, well, that was his point on key splitting. Why, won't, why doesn't key splitting work? He said, well, key splitting works is too slow. Well, he was, he was laying out uh, you know, particular technical factors that one had to consider in implementing such systems. He wasn't right. saying that there was But systems like that process. exist, right? There are systems that allow people's private keys to be protected. You use session keys. The only thing disclosed is the session key. It's specific to the communication the court approves, right? And you protect the private keys. You're not undermining the but, encryption system if you do something like that. I think there's two different questions. I think one is, should law enforcement properly authorized by a a legal authority in a regime that has a robust rule of law, should it have access to particular content? That's one question. I think the answer would be yes. But the second question is, should law enforcement use particular techniques to gain access to that content? Fair. And on that question, I think the answer is no, if you're saying they should use a technique that compromises the security of the global public particularly vulnerable groups. And I think if you're talking about options here, we also need to push back and ask what other options does law enforcement have? And I don't agree with the assertion that all of law enforcement's good arguments are classified. How are we supposed to investigate that? I mean, and how can you really say that it's a good argument if it's developed in, in a, a rather insular community that's not subjected to public scrutiny or critique or helpful feedback? Yeah, I mean, I agree that, that the, that, I mean, and that's what, that's why I'm suggesting that government, they, I think this is actually perhaps uh, as much, if not more so, law, a, a regular everyday law enforcement issue as it is a national security issue. And so if the government is going to say, uh, and, and I think Director Comey has tried to provide a few examples, for example, the ISIL examples, um, although maybe they're not sort of specific, here's the actual case, here's what we were trying to do, you know, here's who the person was. Um, if they don't want to try to provide those examples, that's why in order for the government to demonstrate that this really is a legitimate issue, they have to provide more of the, the law enforcement examples. Now, um, U.S. Attorney in Maryland did that last week. So the U.S. Attorney in Maryland put out a uh, press release in a prosecution involving uh, child uh, sexual abuse and said, this is exactly the kind of case that if uh, these communications, if providers are going to go to default uh, encryption, this is exactly the kind of case that we won't be able to bring. And uh, the facts of it, the, uh, the defendant was Stephen Schaffner. Um, the facts are pretty disgusting. And, uh, and I think anybody would have a hard time arguing that we should, be, we should not be trying, at least trying, to find a technical means to be able to enable law enforcement to have access to those types of communications. And so really, what I'm suggesting is that um, the US Attorney in Maryland has, has you know, started to do this by pointing this out in his press release last week, that this is exactly the type of case we're talking about, and DAs and US attorneys all over the country should start doing that. In an ideal world, I 100% agree with you that law enforcement should have access to particular communications after they obtain a warrant based on probable cause. But that's not the issue. The issue is, should providers be compelled to redesign their systems to suit law enforcement's whim? Okay, so that's, that's an interesting, I think, I think the way you guys have broken the issue down is the right way, which is right, so we, we tackle the first question, right? Should, should the government have lawful access to, to content uh, where a court's granted a court order? Sounds like everyone on this Unanimous that the answer to that question is yes. So then the only question is by what method, right? No, you, the answer. The ans my answer is the, it should be yes, not that it. it, well, is it so is it yes or no? I mean, like this is not. I don't think this is that complicated. It should be yes. Is it? Do you believe, as a matter of principle, that if the U.S. government has a court order for data to convince a federal judge that the person has data that's valid to a relevant criminal investigation, they get the that, data. They that, might get crypto no, no, text, right, but no, they no. get and the if, data. And if the data is encrypted that they should be able to decrypt it, yes or no? Sarah seems to say yes. What do you think? They should be able to try. No, 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 not they should be able to try. Should they be able to obtain the underlying content? Not try, No, not I, I think that's a red herring because that that, red herring? it assumes that an entire case rests on a particular encrypted piece of information. There are so many other... No, no, no. The, court, the 
Is what about what about the metadata? Grant search warrants all the time. Search warrants the perfect example. Well, look, for, for for investigations, they don't say the da the the thing in that house is so re is so relevant, so important. Investigation, it's the one piece of information you need to make your case. No, they and let's say it's in a search state. warrants. Uh, they investigate search warrants all but the it, time. But it's fine to issue a search warrant to obtain a particular communication if that text is encrypted then maybe, maybe not, the law enforcement agent will be able to decrypt it. I, so but I keep all of my contraband in a safe. OK. Uh, law enforcement, <laughs> good to know. I mean, every, everybody, note, law enforcement everybody should, right? Law, when law enforcement wants to search my safe, yeah. which they do, yeah. they get a warrant, a search yes. warrant. Yes. And what do they do, right? They try and crack the safe. They, they get a blowtorch. They get the base, best safe cracker. What they don't do is go to Brinks and say, what the next safe you sell, you have to give us the combo. Okay, and this is where, I mean, this is where the analogy between, this is where the analogy between the physical world and the electronic world starts to break down, because what law, enforcement is saying, what law enforcement is saying is they're saying, this is a safe we can't crack. Now, maybe we can crack it in 100 years if we try, but the victim is not gonna be saved or have any justice that they face as a result. Now, in last week's testimony in front of the Hill, this was the exact question that Senator Franken posed to Professor Swire. He said in the example, this is the example they were discussing in the hearing, was, uh, you know, a, a woman is kidnapped and uh, law enforcement, her family is desperate and law enforcement wants to be able to have access to her phone to figure out who the last people was that she communicated with. Um, and. Uh, and Senator Franklin's question to Professor Swire was, and so what do you do about that problem? If you're saying that we should not try to figure out a technological solution to this with industry cooperation and government, then what's your answer to that? And Professor Swire's answer was, well, yes, there's gonna be some obstacles. It's now, if you're the family of that young woman, this is a little more than an obstacle. And so that really has to be part of the conversation that Maybe it was four cases last year, but is that really sort of from a value standpoint, is that acceptable? Or should we at least be trying to see if we can come to a technical solution that satisfies both but sides? But if you want to discuss the values, you also have to look at the evidence that's repeatedly been put forth, including by Citizen Lab, of how the digital communications of civil society groups and NGOs are regularly compromised because they don't have the digital security that they need. And encryption is one of the main sources of that digital security. They're compromised by repressive regimes all over the world. You know, there, there's the criminal element as well that you have to contend with. But I don't think it's an issue of, well, we have to be able to decrypt this is the only option. I think the technical reality is there are many other tools well, and yeah, techniques. Are, tell, us, tell us about the other options. What are the other options besides? Sure, yeah. sure. And they are also problematic, and I think they deserve more discussion. Basically, this goes back to the uh, market for commercial spyware. In fact, after the debate started to heat up in the United States about widespread use of encryption and what the implications were for law enforcement, um, the ISS World Conference had numerous panels about how to defeat end-to-end -end encryption. This is the product we can offer to sell you that will help you get around this. These are the ways that you can figure out how to get criminals, even if they use Tor and other anonymizers. Basically, this is a market opportunity for these commercial actors. And that's also concerning, but given the fact that this exists, I think we have to press law enforcement a little bit about exactly what their needs are, what they're currently using, and what specific role encryption plays in that as opposed to spyware or other techniques. So are you saying that industry should be trying to come up with ways that they're creating products that government could use to be able to break the encryption? To make your alliance less secure? Those exist. And I don't get it. No, I'm just saying that law enforcement has multiple options on the table. But if that's true, if that's true, then your entire claim about how important encryption is to your, to the people you work with, the democracy activists and the like, it doesn't matter. If you're right that governments have access to all this capability so to it, defeat encryption, then what's the point? It does matter because encryption is wide scale. Encryption is something that the public can easily utilize. And forcing nefarious actors to move over to these, these methods that raise the costs and are more difficult for them to implement will get rid of some of the digital threats that are currently out if there. Right that it doesn't Right? Your, your claim is that what premise, doesn't work. Your claim is premised on the notion that governments can get around encryption. Right? That's your claim. Your claim yes, is, governments you can get around encryption right. through so, device level okay, compromise. So that's true. Well, that's okay, but that's like saying 
if I have access to your home, right, I don't need access to the, the and, and I, that's, But that's house. the world we live in, Jamil. I was in court yesterday here in DC arguing against the government of Ethiopia. Uh, we're suing the government of Ethiopia for wiretapping. Our client's an Ethiopian democracy activist who lives in Silver Spring. Uh, and Ethiopia owned his laptop using a product called FinFisher, which is a competitor to hacking team, which you've probably heard of. If our client, Mr. Kadane, had been using end-to-end -end encryption, um, he wasn't, of course, he was using Skype, um, but if, if he had been using end-to-end -end encryption, that wouldn't have posed a problem for the Ethiopian government. They still would have had access to everything on his computer. Because? Because they owned the endpoint. They, right, they compromised the computer, right? But, but the and a Title III warrant in the United States or something equivalent to it should be sufficient Not to, true. to own an let's endpoint. Take a, let's, take, let's take a simple example, right? You have an end user who you don't know who they are, but you know that, that the communication going to that end user is, is problematic, right? Because you've, you've surveilled them, right? You've obtained surveillance information, whatever it is. You've gone to court and said, I have a court order for this Gmail account, right? You don't know who the owner of that is. You don't have access to the computer that person is in. Trivial. All you have access to. Trivial. Trivial what? To find who the owner of that Gmail account is. Always? Not always. Okay. And right. finding out who the owner of the Gmail account me, is me, goes yeah. more towards me, metadata than to way, access right? to content. We regularly, we the U.S. government, regularly surveil terrorists overseas, right, who use U.S. providers, right? Let me just suggest to you, it is not trivial to find the owner of that account. It is not trivial to find the device. If it is, if it wasn't, we'd be accessing a lot more terrorists than we do today. You're just wrong about that. So, but putting that to one side, right, um, look, I have a lot of sympathy for the position that we should use a ubiquitous encryption. A ubiquitous encryption is critically important to protect the very values that we believe in. But the challenge I see for the privacy community is if we don't resolve this issue, right, and there is another Megan Kanka, right, where the, where the young child is kidnapped, and the, and the thing the government, the reason the government couldn't protect that child was high end encryption, right, or there's a terrorist attack, and the reason we had the data, it was just encrypted, the outcome for the privacy community is going to be disastrous. So it is, it is critical for there to be a real conversation and not just sort of this, well, you know, there are 15 other solutions, you know, you could, you could use brute force, right, you could compromise the endpoint. We all know that in, in, in an effort to investigate a crime that's happening at the time, compromise the endpoint or using brute force are not real solutions. We know this, right? That's why encryption works. That's what makes it great. That's what protects our privacy. And so it's incumbent upon us as advocates uh, for, for, for both uh, the needs of the needs of government and the needs of privacy to find a middle ground, and if we don't, we're going to be at sea because the outcome will not be good. So, the the question that I asked earlier, which uh, neither Jamil nor Kerry answered, would I'm Moxie? What should I do to signal to tech secure? Um, I think there's a reason why they keep saying we should have this conversation with industry. I think the answer is they want Moxie, they want Tim Cook to silently compromise their account without actually having the conversation. Because when I say, what should they do, I don't hear an answer. And I don't hear that answer from Comey either. Uh, I, I haven't heard that answer from anyone, frankly. Not at all. I gave you two, I gave you two, potential, two potential answers. You use a, key you encapsulation use, or split you use, key? You use encapsulation and splitting together. Right, so encapsulation Okay, uses, Moxie says no, then now what? But, but that's, then, then the question becomes, as, as, as has been pointed out on Lawfare, right? Ben Wittes says, look, you've got three options, right? We can mandate it. We can let it go and not get the data, and then we're back in this box of how do you resolve the problem. Two, the government can mandate it through regulation. Or three, you can get civil liability and, and let the courts figure it out. And so, where, there's, so, where, there's a, where there's a kidnapped child and that child is killed, so two and three go, go sue Moxie, and then he's, he's held liable. Your options two and three uh, go away when Moxie moves to Canada, right? Not if, not if Canada, I mean, look, other countries are going to implement these laws. China's already doing it. When he moves Britain's to Sealand, right? But that's, but that's exactly the challenge we face, right? So the question is not, I mean, you can raise every, every problem, but the reality is a lot, of these, a lot of these criminals are here. A lot of these people use US infrastructure, right? So we can make up scenarios where they've gone elsewhere. You can, you can me, keep moving, the, moving the, the sort of thing that I'm, that I'm talking about. But at the end of the day, you've got to answer the question. Where you've got a valid court order and lawful permission to get the data, should the government have the data or not? And I'm telling you that the day that case comes, that terrorist attack, that child is kidnapped, and it's a credible case, that battle is going to be over, and privacy is going to be the, the victim. Well, and so we've got to find a reasonable path forward. And the answer can't be just move the, move the, move the target. 
I think we are all trying to find a reasonable path forward, and I recognize your disaster scenarios here, but what about the scenarios on the other side? The activists, the civil society groups that are being surveilled constantly and getting hauled into an interrogation chamber and being presented with their documents and being the US, the US tortured. The government provides these democracy activists encryption methodologies and tools. We, we, the government, take advantage of these by distributing, I say we have, formally in the U.S. government, the U.S. government has regularly provided to these so, of encryption tools. So if, hi, if the U.S. We have an audience question back here. Break in for a second. Hi, audience. Uh, hi, Kevin. Hi. Hi, Nate. <coughs> Nate and I used to work together. Um, mm -hmm. Kevin Banks and Open Technology Institute. This is obviously a very emotional debate. Um, I've heard the concern and the criticism that people in the privacy community and the security community who are concerned about this are not willing to admit that this can and will be a barrier to law enforcement. That in fact, some people will be hurt, some people may even die because of the deployment of encryption. I'm not afraid to say that. What I haven't heard from the other side is the fact that people can and will and do die because of the failure to deploy encryption. Whether it is the battered spouse who is killed after her husband gets into her phone, whether it's the person who's shot for their phone, which would be a worthless brick if encryption were turned on, whether it's the human rights activist in Burma, um, I can think of many, many other examples where, thanks to encryption, people survive. So are you willing to admit, Ms. Cordero and Mr. Jaffer, that encryption saves lives as well. Absolutely. I, I mean, I think there's a, there's a true, I, I, don't, I wouldn't disagree at all. I wouldn't disagree at all that there is a tremendous public value, and I don't think any of the, of the government folks who have, been who have been furthering this discussion would say that there's not a important public value in the deployment of encryption. But, but, I don't think that we want to be in a position where we can't, the government cannot execute lawful court orders. So that's very different than the spouse trying to get into the other spouse's phone. This is probable cause based court orders that the government in a, is a, going to be in a position where it says it can't, it can't uh, access them. And this is actually sort of, I mean, I, I understand this morning that the discussion includes sort of a history um, of uh, the crypto wars, and, and I would imagine that, that Kalia was, you know, one of the topics of discussion. So this was sort of, you go back and you look at the legislative history of Kalia, part, this, this, not the encryption issue, I mean, encryption was, was, at that point, it wasn't widely available, so the government didn't force that issue. But the issue of whether government needed industry to make it possible for them to execute, actually implement, a valid court order is the reason that Kalia was necessary. But the technology upon which, the way sort of the lines in Kalia were drawn were such that the way that we communicate today doesn't apply anymore. And so we have these categories of communications that are now not able to be obtained pursuant to a lawful court order. And if you look at the legislative history of Kalia, that was not the congressional intent. Let, let the me congressional tweak. intent was to enable the lawful execution of a court order. Let me tweak that. Uh, you, if, I, if I understand your argument correctly, uh, the content of communication should always be accessible pursuant to a lawful court order, right? I think that there, I actually think that there's potentially, if we roll it, like sort of get into the what might be potentially legislative proposals, I think that there's um, potentially I'm ways. So if, if Google should always be uh, able to turn over the content of a Gmail account based uh, pursuant to a lawful court order. Based on a lawful court order. Okay. What about a lawful think, court order? No, hold on one sec. What about a lawful court order from China? What about one from France? What about one from Russia? What about one from okay. Kazakhstan? So, okay, so this gets into the in, into some of the but international that, that issues. That is a these critical are, question. What's it, your answer to it? It absolutely is. So, um, First of all, I think that when you get into the China-Russia, that's like the, on the spectrum of what are the hard questions, 
when you do China, Russia, that's like the hardest end of the spectrum. Let's do France. Okay. So um, this is where I think that the national security and the law enforcement interests potentially are um, in tension. And that's because I think there is a um, harder argument to be made that we would want to give access to uh, a more friendly country's intelligence services um, to be able to access types of communications. However, there is a lot of cooperation that occurs at the international level when it comes to law enforcement, when it comes to actual victims of crime. And so I think there is an argument to be made that at least it should be sort of not off the table that cooperation with foreign law enforcement um, might be appropriate. I mean, other countries have victims too, and if the evidence of that crime is uh, with a U.S. company, I think there's, you know, then the, the legal structure um, perhaps should accommodate that. But now, that's an is... easier question. Hold on, there's a, that's an easier question um, to get at when you're talking about countries with which we have good law enforcement cooperation. But even countries that we have more tense uh, relationships with, there still might be cooperation on law enforcement issues. Now, I'm willing to see that there is probably a category of countries that we wouldn't even want to help with anything. And you know, perhaps Syria would be in that category. Um, but I think that there's a spectrum along well, we with We help Syria is, all the time, right? They're our biggest partner in the war against ISIL. This is not just a question, though, of law enforcement to law enforcement cooperation. It's a question of what companies will be forced to do by the governments in whose jurisdictions they operate if it is known that they possess this capability of being able to turn over a key or provide decrypted content or, or what have you. But they're already facing that today, right? They're already facing that. In China, you take the example of Yahoo, right? The same year that Yahoo uh, litigated uh, against the U.S. government in responding to court orders and what was previously the Protect America Act eventually became the FISA Amendments Act, the same month they were litigating with the U.S. government refusing to provide data under a valid congressionally authorized order, they were turning over data about activists in China to the Chinese government, right? I mean, and so this is already happening. There, and that's exactly. But that's, but that's part exactly of the reason why, why I think that's, that's why I think broad, widespread encryption is critical to protecting privacy and freedom. I think it's dramatically important that we expand the use of, pri of encryption. At the same time, we've got to resolve. It is crazy to think that we can be pro-encryption and press for wide, broad spread encryption to everybody and not resolve the law enforcement issue. To do that is, to, is, is, is a crazy approach because ultimately it will collapse the effort to have broad widespread encryption. If is, we don't resolve the law enforcement issue, we will face a day where it's a massive problem and privacy, and those of us who think that encryption is good, will lose the battle. That's, that's what that's the, the FBI problem. has been I, saying I, for 20 I, years. I, I, there's it a looks, question it, from, it, sorry. Sorry, this might, I've been waiting to ask the question, this might be a good moment to jump in. Um, I think the conversation might be underestimating that it might actually be impossible to do the thing that you want to do. And not, not in the sense of compelling Google or Yahoo to do it, but in the sense of creating an internet ecosystem where you have multiple decentralized providers trying to enable end-to-end -end decentralized communication around a whole suite of applications all over the world and trying to make that secure with a really limited set of tools. And encryption's like the only tool they have to really do that out at the edges. I'm not talking about Google, talking about people who like make a website. The internet's amazing because anyone can make a website. Yeah, that's now, why can anyone, Moxie. Can anyone example. make people secure also on that website? Moxie's the best example. Moxie makes tech secure, which everybody should use. It's the best thing for communicating privately. So it's like, if this was a conversation about law enforcement getting a court order for something that was just impossible, like, a court order for the tech industry to build them a teleporter. So they could teleport into someone's home and search their home and then teleport all the stuff they need out. That would just be impossible. We wouldn't be talking about that. And I, I think something, some of, one of the bugs in this conversation is around that where I don't think we're realizing how uh, essential encryption is to security in a decentralized way and how impossible it is to say, okay, there's a single point of failure, a government that has the backdoor act access and we need to have a really strong ecosystem that has uh, a diverse set of actors trying to make the internet secure. I think there's a paradox there that people aren't appreciating. We would never ask a court order, we would never insist on law enforcement's right to get a court order for the, for the impossible. 
The other thing missing from this conversation, just as an aside, is that no one's recognizing the extent to which law enforcement, including the, in the, within the United States, which is one of the better cases, is just rampantly violating people's human rights right now. Um, and that we need to do something about that. And mainly I'm thinking about the NSA, but, but you know. Is Mark Zulinger in the room right now? Uh, if he's not, anyway. Mark, hey, thanks for representing Yahoo in 2007, 2008. So, uh, so I think these are, these are very good points. Um, and I think on the first question of impossibility, we don't even, we rarely get to the question of impossibility. I mean, I know that that's a, oftentimes part of the discussion. We rarely get to it because there's this de debate right at the beginning. I mean, Nate won't even admit right now, today, or, or agree to the principle that the government should have access to content. He simply says they should have access to the encrypted data. But even with the valid court order, Nate won't concede that the government, if there was a technological, let's say there was, put it aside, we'll, we'll come to that question, right? But we never even get to the question whether it's possible because there's a, there's a fundamental debate about whether government should have access to content. That's an important question. Okay. Fair enough. That's right. I don't, so let's, I don't trust Jamil's expertise any more than I trust mine. Okay, so let's, so let, but then let's have that conversation. Let's say, let's say we could all agree if we agreed, right, that government should have access to content unencrypted when it has a valid order, then we get to the, the discussion of, okay, who are the best technical experts to figure out a way to implement that, right? And then we can go to industry, we can work, get the government together with industry to work that question out. But if we still have a disconnect amongst ourselves about whether the government should have a lawful right with a valid court order to unencrypted content, then there's no point in having the, the is it technologically feasible question. But, but the, the how is critical here. Right, so let's, you let's can't have, answer the first question without answering the so second let's, question. But let's have, if, if there was a way to do it securely. But there isn't. Right, but, but you keep saying that, but I've given you a couple of examples, right, that helps preserve privacy, right, where you don't, where you don't reveal a private key, a long-term private key, right, key encapsulation. Right? And key splitting, where you, where you escrow the keys. And look, I'm not generally a supportive of key escrow. I think there are huge problems with key escrow. But key splitting is one example of where there's not a single point of failure. That's true that if you had, but if you had an M of N system, right, you could make it as large as you wanted, and the key escrow could be split among a wide variety of people. And there, you have a case where you're just talking about session keys, you're talking about limited access, you're talking about not, not disclosing people's private keys to anyone, long-term private keys. And you're talking about splitting among a number of escrow agents who all only respond to valid court orders. Now, there is a scenario where the, the, the downside is dramatically less. I'm not saying it's a perfect system. Far from it. I don't like Kiosko any more than anybody else. Okay? But it's, it's a beginning of a conversation. But we can't even have that conversation if we don't agree on the notion that government should have access, lawful access, with a court order. But Jimmy let's o. suppose... Let's Jimmy o. <laughs> Let's, let's suppose that the situation you're presenting does exist. Yeah. You would still have the problem of encryption because you can't outlaw encryption well, worldwide. You wouldn't be outlawing it. You wouldn't be outlawing it. So I, I, I think the real, the real issue here is who is implementing the encryption? Basically, law enforcement is targeting big companies like Apple and Google, which provide this service to the public at large. Criminals, yes, criminals and terrorists, if they know that they can't use Apple and Google for that, will move to other options let because just, they're properly incentivized to do me, so. But the rest of us who still need that digital security won't be able to do but that. But you'll have digital security. You just won't have it when the government goes to a court and convinces that, that independent federal judge with a lifetime appointment that they have a warrant for your information. You will still have security. The problem is, that's always the case. You can always talk about the, the people on the edge who are going to use the most extreme It's extreme not things. people the on the edge. It's all of us. What about the great cannon? The great cannon attack that compromised numerous computers to launch a DDoS attack um, against groups advocating for uh, advocating against censorship uh, relied on, on encrypted traffic streams. And that compromised many innocent civilians. I mean, this is not an issue of people already having digital security. Right. The, the mere fact of the lack of encryption undermines global public security right, we large. Don't, we don't say because, because, uh, because you know, drug dealers don't talk in their houses and don't talk on the phone and they go sit in their cars and if you ever, ever watch The Wire, you know, they have that conversation about only talk in places we own that we've swept, don't ever talk in the car, walk outside the car, right? talk with your mouth down and your, and your hand covering your mouth. Just because we know criminals will do that doesn't mean we shouldn't have a wiretap law. 
right? I mean, that's, that doesn't, that's not, a, that's not a, a reasonable approach. But I know Kevin, I know Kevin had a question. Or I, a follow -up. I do, and I, I won't ask any more questions after this one today, I promise. No, but um, you, make it, you make it fun, Kevin. So but I feel, like, I feel like there's a category mistake. There's a, there's a fallacy here, and, and we're arguing past each other because of it. You're, you're saying, I can't even get a straight answer whether, I, whether you think the government should be able to get content with a warrant. And I, think, I don't think there's anyone in the, in the audience who would argue against the proposition that with a lawful you know, warrant that satisfies the Fourth Amendment, the government can constitutionally obtain content. However, unencrypted however, content? Huh? Un decrypted content? It's, it's not whether they can constitutionally yeah. obtain it. They can. The question is, can they obtain it yes. in a practical and matter? This is where I think the, the category mistake is happening. The fact is, the Fourth Amendment is my right, is our right, against unreasonable searches and seizures with a presumption that warranted seizures and searches are constitutional. It is not the right of the state to insist that the world be architected to facilitate right. whatever That's search right. the government right. is authorized and, to and, do. And, and, Kevin, you're right. Kevin, and, 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 and look, activists, activists have made this point since the early 90s, and you're absolutely right, that the Fourth Amendment is a protection for us citizens and not a right to the government to have access to your data. That's absolutely true, right? But, and, I, and we, you, no, no, but, no, no, but you, but we agree on that, Kevin. The, the, question, the question only becomes right Right, and so this isn't a constitutional question. This is a question of should Congress legislate to ensure that that the government can get access in an effort to protect, right, in in a civil society, you have to be able to protect your society. That's one of the core functions of the government. Even those of us who believe strongly in a very limited government believe that is the one limited role of government is to protect society from bad actors within society, right? Um, and in those cases, should the government be able to add, obtain the unencrypted content? And Nate still won't answer that question. He still the, says, yes, they should be able to obtain the encrypted content. The Fine. last time government tried to do this, it resulted in freak. Yeah. It resulted don't, in logjam. But, don't, but, don't, but, but Nate, don't give me a canard about the clipper chip and freak and logjam. Tell me whether you, whether you think, yes or no, as a principled matter, should the government, where it has a lawful court order, be able to have access to on an, I, I'm happy to answer Kevin's question. Yes, encryption has saved lives. We should have ubiquitous, worldwide, strong encryption. I believe that 100%. All right, we've got another question back so here. So the, the answer, the, my answer to your question is, yes, they should, but that's aspirational. That is not a technical requirement. Should it be required as a matter of law? Absolutely not. OK, that's, there you go. All right, so Nate, since you called on me, I'm going to ask a question. But it's mostly for Carrie and Jamil. It's Mark Swillinger. If we knew, if we knew for certainty that we cannot build a system that will get the US government access to communications on a provider's network without giving the same access to the Chinese government. And if we knew that if we required US companies to have that access built into their product, half of the criminals and terrorists would move to a different product not provided by a US provider. If we knew that those were the two outcomes, the Chinese government gets access to anything they want, and the bad guys, 50% of them, switch to a provider who doesn't have it built in, do you still want it? Do you still want that access to be mandated? The reality is, I think, Mark, from my yes, perspective. Yes or no, Wait, no, you've thrown a lot of hypotheticals out. <laughs> Same no rules. Do you still, if those are the rules, do you still want US providers to be required to provide access to yes. unencrypted communications? Yes. Yeah. Carrie? Ubiquity. You, and the reason why, Mark, the reason why, Mark, is ubiquity, right? The reality is that even, even if you can force other people to the edges, the vast majority of people, Right, we'll use the, the provider of, look, I don't, I don't well, the use the- the hypo was 50% of the bad guys. No, but, but, the hypo was 50% of the bad guys. But, 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 Bart, but Mark, you're setting up a straw man, right? You're setting up a straw man. The reality uh, is, the, rea uh, Jamil, the reality- Jamil, I think you've been doing that for 45 is, minutes. The reality is that it's hard, it's hard, Mark, it's hard to implement PGP, right? It's, it, it's made easier by a lot of tools that are out there today. But how many of the people in this audience, and this is a pretty privacy heavy crowd, right? Who regularly uses PGP to encrypt your emails every day? Day in, day out, all your emails. Not even half, not even half of this audience, which is probably the most privacy encryption heavy crowd in America. Yes, but I use iMessage 300 times a day and it's all encrypted back right. and forth. I don't need to use PGP but you anymore. Do, you do, but, I'm, but I'm about, look at this audience, right? This is literally the market, but it doesn't happen. And the reason why, it's hard. It's a pain in the rear, right? It's difficult. So the reality is that for those people who don't, who are highly privacy sensitive, including myself, right? You're still gonna have access and the truth is, People, even terrorists, even criminals, right? Even, even you know, mafiosos who know it's a bad idea to talk on the phone. 
They talk on the phone. They use email. They use Gmail. They use Yahoo. That's reality. The reason why Google's under so much pressure post Snowden and Yahoo's under so much pressure post Snowden and AT&T and Verizon is because the reality is they're as usable. What so about just, just one, one quick follow up since I had a nice debate with Karen in the Wall Street Journal. Do you have an answer to the question? Sure. So, you know, as, as we were discussing earlier, I think when you get to the China question, I think that's like one of the, uh, in this like, you know, scheme of this debate, I think the China question is like probably one of the hardest issues to resolve. And I don't know that I have 100% um, uh, sort of resolution to that question. I do think, as I said earlier, I do think that there are circumstances where even countries that we might have hostile intelligence relations with or, or uh, you know, be uh, victims of cyber attacks from and that sort of thing, there still, I think, is, is a role for cooperation in law enforcement issues. And so I think there's, you know, there is a spectrum of countries that even if we have bad relations in sort of categories A through E, on law enforcement category F, there might be uh, reasons that we would want to be able to um, respond in that way. On the question of, of targets moving, uh, you know, moving providers, gosh, if the last few years of all the information that has been declassified is any indication, it still seems that despite sort of a, a, a pretty robust public debate and a lot of information public that there wasn't before, that Target still seem to be using a lot of the uh, technological infrastructure that's in the United States. And I base that, I've been out of government a few years, um, but I saw it in government and, and based on the uh, statements that the director and others have made, it seems like it's still the case. What I, what I, what I think I hear yes no? from Nate, well, it's, it's, on the China issue, I think they're particular on, on foreign governments. I think there potentially is a uh, role for law enforcement cooperation. So that's a yes. So it's a it's a qualified yes. I'm not sure. I, I am not sure when it gets to a country like Syria, as I said earlier. Um, and it's and I think it's one of the hardest questions. And I'm still thinking about it. Um, that that's and my we, answer. And so we, we have another have, we have, question. We have a problem today on wireline, right? It's not like we don't have access to wiretaps, right? Valid access to unencrypted wiretaps. Right, but we don't just give the Chinese information from our wiretaps. We don't give it to other bad actor nations like Syria. So we're not going to do that in this context either. And so the, the question isn't, isn't a reasonable how, question. How so on the earth notion, are we not going to give it to China? What the? How on earth are we not going to give that power to China? If we, if we require U.S. Let's, let's take Today. Apple. No, let's take Apple as an example. Today's if we require right. Apple to re-engineer iMessage to get access to plain text, how does Apple say no to China? I, I just gave you an example using key encapsulation, which you still haven't responded to, by the way. But then, but then said, Apple, hold on, hold on. Key let me, let me, but, but then Apple will not be allowed to sell in China. If I could get through it, right? Key, key encapsulation, but that's true today. Yahoo fought the US government, Mark represented Yahoo, fought the US government all the while handing over data about dissidents, democracy dissidents, to the Chinese government because they wanted to operate in China. So they do it today. Apple they does say you're the defender of your civil liberties. Does it today, 2007, right, Mark? True. You gave. That's right. About democracy actors in China to the Chinese government while right. you were fighting us We've on 702. We've got another audience question back here. Right back here. Sorry to interrupt a metadata versus data conversation uh, with some data. I would like to get back to the safe uh, analogy that we talked about earlier. Should the U.S legislate that all US-based manufacturers provide a secret combination to safes. And, and if so, does or does not the Fifth Amendment protect people from not revealing their own password to that safe? Yeah, so now that gets into a very, a very hard question about testimonial privilege and the like that's been fought in the courts quite a bit. But let's talk about the safe example, because that's a good one, right? If you could build a safe that was impossible to crack and impossible to get into, I think there's a valid debate to be had about that question. Right? Today, that's not true. Today, you can break a, a lock on a door. You can break into almost any safe. For what about 12 years about, in the late what, 1800s, what we're, it was true. What we're, and there was no, no debate, no question that Congress was going to legislate anything for safe manufacturers. Right? There, but between the time that, that tumbler locks got really, really good and the time that TNT was, uh, like, shape charges were perfected, there were unbreakable safes in the United States for yeah, about 12 were, years. And... and, and were, it, sorry, to, I teleported. And it wasn't a problem. <laughs> it wasn't a problem. You have back, you have 
uh, endpoint security problems. You can, there are these same tools. You have welding torches that basically compromise the computer instead. There are these tools in the digital world analogy as well. Oh, so what you're saying is that like, like, like the cracking a safe, you'd say endpoint, endpoint access is like, is like the breaking the safe up. And that's a fair point. And, and we, we talked about that. And where you can have access to endpoints, that's a, that's a fair point. I mean, I, th I, I don't think if law enforcement had the ability to, this is sort of the brute force argument, if they had the ability to get into um, these devices or, or accounts or whatever it is where the content is that they want in these investigations, if they had the ability to do it, they probably wouldn't have launched this sort of public conversation. Oh, just a lot I think the it. issue is that they're in a situation right now where they simply cannot get in physically. I mean, there's, there's not a whole lot of examples that we can think of in the physical space where that is the situation. Okay, Ross we have a couple Albrecht, audience Snatch questions. Hi, so I'm pretty sure a lot of people in this room probably read last week's report, the Keys Under Doormats report. And I had a question for you guys about sort of legal, uh, about laws and also feasibility. And it's not necessarily the technical feasibility question. They brought up a really great point saying, it's probably a bad idea to pass a law that people aren't going to adhere to when you don't know what you'll do if they don't. And so the case was, most people use the examples of Apple and Google, which are large companies when they say things like key splitting. But what happens if I'm in Silicon Valley and I create my own encrypted text service? What is the option for the government? Do you regulate my service? Do you put a firewall up that means people in America can't use services like mine? Do you make it illegal to use that type of service? Not everyone uses Apple and Google services. So what's going to happen when you ask for backdoors from small companies or from the types of encrypted products that we talk about here? Passing a law where we're not exactly sure how we're, what criminal recourse we're going to have or what legal situation we're going to use for people who choose to use encryption, what is the option from law enforcement? I, I mean, I'll, I'll start off and, and, and then you guys weigh in. Um, I mean, my sense from the, at least from the, the government perspective is, is I would think that they probably don't expect a 100% perfect solution. So let's say that there was legislation that said um, industry, you know, industry needs to be able to respond with intelligible content in response to a warrant. Um, is it anticipated that 100% of uh, companies that provide some sort of communication service would be able to comply with that? I would say it, it, it's very possible that, that the answer may be no, but it probably would be a big improvement from the law enforcement community's perspective if at least the major players were able to comply. And, and that's why at least uh, I don't hear Jamil calling for legislation, and I think that's why. I think what they want is they want Apple to silently compromise the system. Tim Cook has said he won't, and I believe him. Um, Moxie has said he won't, and I really believe him. Uh, but th they don't want legislation because they know legislation isn't going to work. No, what I they actually, want is silent capitulation. No, I'm actually, I'm actually happy, to, I'm happy to call for legislation. I'm happy to have a public debate about it. I think we, I think we owe it. We owe it to, let me actually be even clearer, right, Nate? I think we owe it to the American people to have a debate about this question. Okay. And, no, no, and let me I want to hear your proposed language. No, but let, me, but let me finish, right? I think we owe it to the American people to have a debate about whether, in fact, the government in these scenarios where they have a probable cause court order should have access to content. We need to have that debate. Congress needs to debate that issue and vote on that question. Then they need to vote on the question of, okay, if that's technologically, is that technologically feasible? And if it is, how are we going to implement it? And that's a separate question. But Congress ought to have that debate. We ought to have it in public. We ought to have the companies up. Everybody ought to talk about it. We ought to have the people who wrote the, 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 the keys on a doormat, a report, come up and testify on this issue. We ought to have a public debate, not sweep it on a doormat, not do it through regulation, not do it through behind closed doors. Let's have it out in the open. Okay, I'm the speaking of debate, we, owe it we to have another have question. If I can respond for a second to, to Nate's comment as well. Um, I, I think the sort of the... the uh, environment of the companies doing this quietly behind the scenes, I don't, I think that's over. 
I mean, no, in that's the what current Google environment. Did. So I don't, I don't think in, I don't, my sense is that in the current environment, I would be very surprised okay. if that were to happen. So I think this actually, let me finish. I think this actually is a legislative debate. And the only reason that there's not legislation on the table is because the White House is dragging its feet and not uh, agreeing to put forth legislation. I, and I think this is an internal executive branch um, debate that's going on, which is why there's not text on the table. Can I get a show of hands for just a second? Do you, who here, who in the room remembers uh, last fall when Google announced that it would be encrypting data storage on Android by default? Okay, keep your hands up. Who here thinks that that actually happened? All right, good. Uh, hint, it didn't happen. That's, that's the victory scenario uh, uh, for the FBI. I've been told to interrupt. But I, I, we just, I just, I literally just said to you, uh, Nate, that's not, I don't want to win that way. I want to have this debate. That's why I'm sitting up here having the conversation with you in, a, in, a, in an audience to talk about encryption. We're having the discussion. This is the debate, Nate. It's not being hidden behind yes. closed doors. There's yes. no secret deal being cut. I think it will be, I think it will be quiet uh, when things change. And that's what happened in the 90s when I was in government. I was approached by people in Silicon Valley to see what we could do to get NSA to change its position on export control, on encryption technology. And I said, no, they're never going to do that. Just one day they're not going to show up. And that's what happened. But as far as, I mean, politicians, for better or for worse, are going to be making these decisions. Even the court, in some, to some extent, they're politicians. And from a political standpoint, they're going to look at it. We have 100 people who might be killed here in a terrorist attack. Would be be willing to trade that off for 100 activists in China being arrested. Politicians in America are going to say, yes, we will make that trade off. Now, that may not be the right trade off, but that's the kind of, that's the way they see the situation. So the question is if the government is going to have a policy, a law, that requires decryption, that requires a way to access this information in the clear, what kind of system should be in place to minimize the opportunity for uh, employees of the government looking at things they shouldn't, to make sure that oversight is adequate to prevent the government from misusing the information? I mean, think of what might be the structure of a policy if at some point there is a system whereby government does have a way with proper legal process, a court order, to get access to this. And that's what I haven't seen discussed. It seems as though the push is only for greater and greater protection. My belief is, having worked on this in the Intelligence Committee on the House side years ago, is that at some point government will have access to this. The question is whether you're going to have a system in place to police it adequately. And, 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 and by the way, Nate, if, you, if you're right that these companies are caving in private, well, that should worry you a lot more than having this debate in Congress. It should, you should want to have this debate. You, we should have this conversation and find a path forward. Because if you're right and companies are already caving, they're going to cave the next time a terrorist attack happens. They're going to cave the next time a, a child is kidnapped. So if they're already caving, we got to create a structure that protects privacy the right way. Because if we don't have that conversation, we're not in that conversation, then we, the activists who believe in privacy, lose. Which is exactly why you need to have a system where they can't cave because it's technically impossible. And that's why you need robust encryption. And I think we also, if we're going to have this debate... But you just said earlier, I, I'm so confused now, because you said earlier, there are ways around robust encryption. But now you're saying there has to be a way to make sure they don't cave because there's no... No, it doesn't need to be confusing because the ways around robust encryption depend on device level compromise, which itself is problematic, as I've said, but that takes the company out of the picture. You're talking about the user's specific device and whether or not a malicious actor is able to but get wouldn't, into it. Wouldn't it be better, wouldn't it be better to have a system where the companies were involved and you, you were- I'd just like to continue flat. with my other point as well. Any public debate should account for international human rights law, and that includes the right to freedom of expression. It includes the right to benefits of scientific progress of which encryption and other digital advancements are. And the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, who will be speaking later today, has addressed this issue. And he is very concerned about efforts such as these to undermine digital security standards 
that encryption helps support. And so I think we need to take account of that international human rights law perspective as well, which the United States is itself trying to advance in many different forums. I think if we weaken that or don't follow that ourselves, that's definitely going to put us in a difficult spot when we try to advocate the same to repressive regimes such as China. Isn't it also, I mean, isn't it also a, a human rights issue from the perspective of we need government to be able to implement court orders to be able to protect victims of human trafficking and, and victims of child exploitation and it all these sorts is. of things? It certainly is. So let's just, it certainly is. It certainly is. And so let's discuss what law enforcement's options really are. And, and they need to come to the table and tell us what those really are. Because it's not just a matter of encryption, no encryption. If, if I want to, Jamil, I'm going to take host privilege just for a second. Um, because I'm curious, you talked about legislation and we've talked about a few different things. And right now in the UK, there's a law called the Data Retention and Investigatory Powers Act that sunsets next year. And next year, it, what, they're, what we're expecting will be introduced is a CALEA type, CALEA 2 type law that will basically require this lawful act of access by UK law enforcement and will impose that access on any company doing business within the UK. And we all know on the internet that means everybody. So what is the need in the US for, law, for a law if the same law is already being introduced in other countries, UK, France, um, countries where these companies are doing business? What is the jurisdictional problem? And what is then the need to Nate and Sarah for activism, not only in the US, but to expand outside? And there's another question too, and I'm gonna let her piggyback onto me. Sorry, I just wanted to point out, to, to, I mean, I think that this, this um, question you've been beating with a stick, should, you know, should, should, should the government with a, with a proper warrant have access to be able to decrypt communications is a red herring. It's, it's just not the case that the government, even with a proper warrant, actually can get everything it wants, nor do we construct the whole world that way. But I want to say, moreover, it has absolutely nothing to do with the international legal framework that governs such questions. Not only is it not the constitutional framework, it has nothing to do with international standards of privacy. So your claim that you're being a big defender of privacy against the horrible moment we discover that you know, a child has been raped but for uh, you know, the ability to have access to those decrypted uh, communications, uh, a case I have to say I have yet to encounter. Um, it's in it the is, U.S. Think, it attorney is, from Maryland. It is specious because, it, because the question is, is the intrusion on everybody's privacy justified by the interest in the cases of crime or terrorism or whatever that you will not be able to more swiftly prevent or solve? And to that point, the point that Kelly made at the outset is very pertinent, that the law enforcement community has done a terrible job in bringing forth any kind of convincing argument that, in fact, the sky is falling. We have not gone dark. We have simply gone, we are simply going from what is the best golden age of surveillance to maybe what is, I don't know, the silver age of surveillance because it's still so much more surveillance and so much more access than the government has ever had to the communications of everybody, including criminals, than it had prior to the internet or even prior to encryption. So we have to keep this in some kind of perspective. It's always a balance. It's not an absolute. And I would like you to get off that point because I think you're actually damaging your own case. Well, so I think, these are, I think it's an important point that you make. Um, I think the one, the one real challenge is, um, you know, you don't, you haven't seen the example of a case that makes bad law in this area. Well, who in here supports the Patriot Act? How many people are fans of the Patri USA Patriot Act? That act passed zero. Ha right, and that act passed what? Ten days after 9/11? 12 days after 9/11? Right? Why? Because we had a terrorist attack, and the government responded, and Congress voted for it in overwhelming majorities. The day it happens, who? I, mean, I, I think people in here might be split on Megan's law. Right, Megan's law, the uh, right, the thing in California, with Megan Kanka, right? Might be different views on that, right? Passed easily in the California legislature after that kidnapping and the high-profile thing. These things do happen, right? And so I think it's critical that we try to, knowing these are issues, knowing these are real problems, 
We can't simply sweep them under the rug and say it's too, it, it may be technically impossible. If it's technically impossible, that's one thing. We have to figure that out. It may, we know, though, that this is a real problem. Right? We know that there are people who use encryption who are doing bad things. Doesn't mean we have to solve it with a, with a, with a, with a you know, by whacking it over the head with a, with a broad brush, but it means we gotta, we gotta work on this problem. And if we don't work together to solve this problem, right, we're going to come to the day, I believe, where we will lose the battle completely uh, because, because you will get bad law. The Patriot Act is, is, is case in point number one for those of you who think it's a bad idea, and I think that's everyone in this room. That also gets to the point that was made a little bit earlier um, in the back of the room, which is that this may very, if, if this really is a legislative debate that we're having, that the legislative framework therefore becomes really important. So you don't, if, if, if that's if where we're gonna end up, as Jamil suggests, is gonna be some, some way, if, it become, if it's technically possible for law enforcement to have access, wouldn't that be better with an actual statutory framework where the rules are clear, there's accountability, there's oversight, and there's transparency about what the rules are. So we have just five minutes left for just a few more audience questions. Uh, I'd just like to ask for those of you who want to uh, regulate uh, encryption and require back doors, if part of that proposal would be to make it a crime for any individual on their own to use encryption that doesn't meet your standard. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. As I've said before, I think that the use of, of broad encryption is critical to privacy, and it's important. It's important to protect our transactions in cyberspace. It's important to protect privacy and democracy activists, right? All I'm saying is that we've got to weigh in this balance the legitimate needs of the government who we've charged with protecting us. We've got to weigh that. If we don't weigh that, the day will come when that outweighs the privacy balance and, and, and privacy will be the loser, right? And history is littered with examples of that, right? We have laws. The wiretap law is on the books. FISA is on the books. 702 is on the books. 215 is on the books, was on the books. The, there's now, the, the USA Freedom Act is now on the books. It's not like the government doesn't have the ability to convince Congress to pass these laws. It does, and it wins every time. So if you believe in privacy, and you believe in ensuring that your privacy is protected, the best way to do that is to win the debate in the legislature, not pretend like it's a debate you don't have to fight, and that you're just going to win by, by saying it's impossible, it's never going to happen, it's a disaster, it's horrible. So that's a losing, pro that's a losing premise for, for privacy advocates. If, if, if I may, my absolute nightmare scenario on this is having Congress vote on whether it's technically possible to implement a secure <laughs> key splitting system. Er that's the worst possible thing that could happen. And yet, and yet Congress votes on surveillance laws all the time. Yet Congress tries to regulate cybersecurity all the time, and we fight that, right? And the reality is, they do it anyways. They do it anyways. So we got to figure out a way to, to, to get it right. Okay, you're right. That would be a disaster. That's why we need to find legislation that doesn't legislate technically. What if the answer is no? What if the answer is no, it's not technically possible? Then what do we do? That's a great question. Well, so, look, take, take well, that. What's your answer to it? Well, we're not there yet. There, yes, we are. There. No, I, don't, I disagree, Nate. There. There's a whole, pre, there's a predisposition that, that. Cryptographers in the room. Is say, it technically possible? Or, or take a so better let me example. Let me explain why I reject that argument. So, as a lawyer who, who worked in government in the past, working a lot with technologists, there's all sorts of examples that we can look back on where on one day something wasn't possible, and then, lo and behold, people work on it real, real hard, and then it becomes possible. And so, I know that this is the man on the moon argument and the golden keys and all that, that, you know, if we can go to the moon, then, then you know, we should be able to solve this. But they're actually, and I think this is why you saw Director Comey's skepticism as well when the technologists say it's not possible. Herb Lynn, a, a researcher at Stanford, has said it needs to be studied more. And I think that that's a reasonable approach, that we're not, we, I think you're just not going to find that people are going to accept that based on the discussion that we've had so far, the technical answer is no and it's no forever. But what Look, if it is? Sometimes it becomes possible because you've destroyed much brighter futures. Like if you take Bitcoin as an example, say you served a warrant on Bitcoin right now. Right now, you can serve a warrant to a bank and say, we are seizing those funds. Try serving those funds, try serving that warrant on Bitcoin. Is it possible? It's That's not possible. Now, so what do you do? Let's take the example, your, your cases are, what do you do? You have to compel Bitcoin to change itself to serve warrants, to, to accept those warrants, which means you have to turn Bitcoin into something that is not Bitcoin, 
or you have to make it illegal for anybody to make Bitcoin within your jurisdiction. And really, since Bitcoin's already existing and has a community around it that's outside the jurisdiction, you need to make it illegal for any single person to use Bitcoin in order to create the world in which the world responds to your warrant. And now we're not just talking about Bitcoin, we're talking about all blockchain technologies. We're talking about potentially something that's even bigger than the internet. And, the, and, and, and so when in those cases where government says, we are just going to force this until it works the way we want, Sometimes you destroy so much in the process. And, you could be destroying an entire future that we'll never even see that could be right. much better than what we have now. You're totally right. And what about the history of governments around the world, whether in this country or others, leads you to believe they won't but, do it? But here's they the will. thing. Let's that's, wait until they do. No, but Instead but of saying, we have to do no, it first. No, but, no, but that's, no, but that's, <laughs> I mean, your whole argument is, no, but that's, but that's, let's, let's destroy it now so that government no, no, won't be able to destroy it later. You're absolutely but that's right. Exactly, but that's exactly what's happening. The bad actors in the world are already doing that, right? China's already doing it. No, all right, not, guys. No, we need to get I hate to shut you all down. We need to make the better deal. But in the name of time, sorry, Holmes. If you guys can give your last 30 second statements, like what would you want to wrap up on? I give Sarah my 30 seconds because she, she, she wants to say something. Sure, yeah. I just want to remind everyone that the United States has ratified the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which protects the right to freedom of expression and the right to privacy. And the infringements on those rights need to be necessary. Sarah, Sarah since, since, since the ICCPR provisions, <laughs> since the ICCPR provisions on those issues, freedom of expression and privacy, were built by Americans based on our First Amendment and our Constitution, right? I think we're pretty, I think we're pretty good on just looking at our own Constitution to figure out what the rules ought to be in the United States. It affects the world, not just the US. Yeah, no doubt, but we should comply with our laws and our okay, Constitution, which is the genesis. What's that? 30 second wrap up, do it. We, Look, I think I think I think we have got we have got to get through debates like this and continue to have this conversation and really get to a resolution because at the end of the day, in my view, if we don't resolve this issue, at the end of the day, the government will succeed. They will get their access and privacy will suffer. So until we are in the room and we're making the deal, we're making a good deal for privacy, right? This is gonna happen. And Nate's right, right? These things do happen behind closed doors, and we have a responsibility to make sure it doesn't happen behind closed doors, it happens behind open doors, and that we get the best deal possible. So I'll end where I started, which is that, uh, number one, I think there needs to be an acknowledgement that there's a legitimate public safety and public interest uh, aspect to this debate. Two, I think the government, especially at the state and local level, needs to do a better job of explaining the need so that both industry and the public understand why we need to get to a solution. And three, I think this probably is going to turn into a legislative debate, and perhaps that'll be for a good thing, because then we'll actually have something tangible upon uh, which to have for the debate. I think I would just end, whoa, this got really loud. Um, I think I would just end by saying that I support Moxie Marlin Spike's First Amendment right to produce signal as he sees fit. Thank you, all, all of our speakers. Thank you so much for being here and for having this conversation. We really appreciate it.